Well, thank you very much, Verena. Um, exactly, this is this is one thing that is a piece of information that you might find interesting is that um, as soon as this paper comes out, which should be in a couple of weeks, uh, registered participants will be informed of this immediately. So if you want to register, we also posted some information on this in the chat. So if you want to be informed right away, then why don't you please send a message to the contact provided in the chat and then we will inform you. And also this webinar is being recorded. We will put it online and we will also link to um, this study and also other background studies by the other speakers. So this would be additional information that uh, will be available to you afterwards. So um, now why don't we uh, uh, switch over to Johanna uh, for some clarification questions. Uh, yeah, great. Thanks, Alex. I have a couple of clarification questions. Uh, First one, uh, Verena, if you say the MSR is working, uh, what do you mean by that? What is your definition of the MSR is working? Mm -hmm. And uh, second question around economic recovery in the wake of the COVID crisis. Uh, did you also look at uh, sort of the, the response of the MSR to economic recovery in increasing supply uh, and look at questions around uh, should you not keep EUAs rather than deleting them um, to safeguard for this uh, possibly rapid recovery and avoid cross-sectional correction factor? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for those questions. Um, is it working? The question is, can it reduce the structural oversupply that we have accumulated over the years? It's a historic oversupply and there's a new one um, built up. Um, and the question of the economic recovery. Well, at the moment, we are still handling an, a historic oversupply that has nothing to do with COVID yet. Um, and Therefore, if in these years we reduce the MSR amounts further, this will not impact um, the, the new allowances needed in case of speedy recovery. And also we see that um, the new allocation rules for industry do reflect um, activity rate changes. So um, this will also be reflected in, in free allocation that is, of course, not part of the MSR. And um, whether the rapid recovery really will overshoot emissions a, a lot higher than was expected before the crisis came along, I wonder whether that's realistic. I think if we see the economy to recover the levels before the crisis, um, then this is a very positive scenario. Um, yeah, and for this, of course, the MSR um, or the current um, the current uh, amounts are set. Okay, I just had another question come in. Do we still have time, Alex? If it's, I think if it's on clarification, I think we do, but we should try to be okay. as brief as possible. Uh, and also because some people seem to have trouble to post uh, to everyone or to all. So uh, if you do have trouble, uh, you're welcome to just post uh, the question to me and I'll um, collect them and ask them. Okay, then Verena, very quickly on uh, voluntary cancellation, um, maybe a clarification of uh, what you mean or what we mean by EU-wide uh, EU wide voluntary cancellation system. I guess we don't really quite go that far, but say something about how rules could be harmonized. Uh, and the, the comment is here that if there was a EU wide voluntary cancellation system, this could look like arbitrary cancellations from the MSR, which might go against its character of a market based uh, instrument. Mm -hmm. Well, voluntary cancellation can be um, activated if power plants are closed. And then, of course, we do see or we do expect that emissions decline constantly for, for the next uh, years. And therefore, um, I do feel that it should be able to reflect those emission reductions. We have seen in the power sector astonishing emission reductions, by the way. Um, we haven't seen such uh, ones in the industry sector, and therefore this voluntary rule only re 
um, refers to the power sector. And well, what is a rule based one? Currently, it refers to the average emissions of the last five years. This is the maximum amount that can be cancelled. Um, we suggest that we could ref um, base the cancellation on the installed capacity because we do see effects of um, those uh, power plants that are close to run very little hours in the last years. And therefore their last five years emissions are not very representative of what emission savings are really gained by closing those uh, power plants. And the idea would be that we have a uniform rule and it's easy to apply and um, governments don't have always to take the political decision, but it's automatically activated. Of course, it does interact with the MSR, but the interaction is that is uh, that the MSR reduces the effect of the voluntary cancellation and the voluntary cancellation does um, reduces a, a part of the effect in the MSR. So they don't add, add up uh, entirely, but it does uh, add up. Great, thank you. Uh, so, so then I suggest any further questions, including more really specific ones, uh, we can we can then um, address in the discussion session. So now, if you don't mind, let us move on to um, Christian Perino from the University of Hamburg, who will be giving us a talk on the EU ETS stability mechanism needs a new design. Let me just say a few words on Grisha. He has been a professor in environmental economics at the University of Hamburg since 2013. Um, he is also the principal investigator at the cluster of excellence um, called Climate, Climate Change and Society, uh, where he heads the project on dynamics of climate governance. His work focuses on the design and effects of climate policy instruments, and in particular, the EU ETS and the MSR. So, Grisha, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, welcome from my side as well. Um, the presentation I'm going to give today is based on a, on a, a essentially a policy brief that was written by um, six of us. And we are four economists and two legal scholars and uh, trying kind of to combine our, our expertise. Uh, Today, I will mainly focus on the economics part, um, but feel free to, to ask me the legal questions as well. I will then probably mainly respond by hand waving. Um, but we do have in the paper uh, an entire section on the legal aspects of what I'm going to uh, discuss today. So the perspective I'm going to take will be a, a quite a bit more conceptual than, than what Verena has uh, just uh, presented to us. So I won't give you any numbers, um, but I do have some colorful graphs. And the market stability reserve is essentially something like an autopilot of the EU emission trading system. And it is so because it, it is designed to automatically respond to changes or to expected changes in market conditions. And it does so, yes, by adjusting the supply of allowances both in the short and in the long run. And the crucial point is that it does so based on what is called the total number of allowances in circulation, which is essentially the uh, entire uh, number of allowances that have been issued but not yet been used um, to certify emissions. And it has a number of aims, and here I just uh, name I think the three most important ones that are also um, part of the uh, of the legislation. And the first one is to reduce demand supply imbalances, and of course the historic one as well as any um, that might arise in the future. The second is to increase synergies with other climate and energy policies, such as the coal phase out that uh, Verena already mentioned as well. And of course, the third one is to stimulate low carbon investments, um, which to some extent at least might be translated into rising uh, prices. And to kind of already uh, tell you kind of the, 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 the gist of, of uh, my uh, talk today is that the root of the problem of, uh, that we identified for what the MSR will not be able or is not able to do 
is that it's based on the TNAC. Um, as we will explain, it's, it's an inadequate measure of scarcity and essentially of um, uh, that uh, of that supply demand imbalance um, if you also take into account the future because of course the EUTS is a intertemporal market. It's not only driven by current um, supply and demand uh, situations but also about what participants expect future supply and demand to look like. Um, and especially in that uh, in that um, for that point, the TNAC unfortunately is, is inadequate. Um, and as we will see, the, the way the MSR is designed, it, it kind of works well for what happened in the past and for what happens right now. Um, for, so something like, like COVID, the, an unexpected shock that is immediately there, um, that kind of works. Um, but something like a coal phase out, where you already know that over the next 10, 20 years, there will be a systematic change. There actually the MSR works really badly. Um, and here just kind of a, a plain illustration. So if your reality looks like, kind of, oh yeah, you know, there's a left turn ahead um, in uh, essentially the expected um, scarcity of allowances, the TNAC will actually tell you exactly the opposite, at least if that um, turn is um, far enough into the future. So the measure on which the um, MSR is built is fine for what happened in the past, but it's systematically off for everything um, that's in the future and the further it's in the future, the more it is off. And essentially kind of, let's go one step back, namely to the time before the um, MSR was introduced. And here um, for simplicity, I, I just focus on the kind of long run cap. Um, before 2018, before the cancellation mechanism was introduced, the long run cap was essentially fixed. Um, so there was a fixed supply and any um, change in uh, demand, um, either by economic uh, up or down swings or by overlapping policies, essentially just translated into a price response. Um, but of course, the overall supply and hence overall emissions were not affected. Then the um, MSR was introduced with the objective of introducing a mechanism that would allow stabilizing um, adjustments. Meaning if demand goes down, supply would contract as well. And this has uh, two effects. One is that the price response to such a demand shock is reduced. It's dampened. So the price responds by less than it would have in the old system with a fixed cap. The other one is that we now actually have an impact on emissions. So the MSR, if it works properly, would respond to shutting down a coal-fired power plant by reducing allowances. And then hence kind of um, producing an automatic climate benefit of the overlapping policy. So that, that's the idea. And that actually works for changes that happen right now, this year, or that happened in the past. Um, so in that uh, aspect, the MSR actually um, at a conceptual level does its job. Unfortunately, exactly the opposite holds for anticipated adjustments in demand. Um, so if today governments announce that over the next 10, 15 years, they are gradually shutting down coal-fired power plants, and hence we already know that there is a change in demand that is unrelated to market prices, then the MSR responds exactly in the wrong way. Now, why is that? because um, if firms anticipate that scarcity in the future decreases because there will be less demand for allowances once those power plants are offline, they actually have less, less incentive to bank, to bank allowances. They will emit more today already. The price will drop. Um, and if the TNAC that measures um, how many leftover allowances there are decreases because firms emit more today already, 
then it will cancel less allowances and thereby, by comparing the two, the two situations, increase supply. So we have a reduction in demand and the MSR responds by canceling fewer allowances, which essentially is the same as um, having more than, than before or were anticipated before. And this has two effects and both we don't like because the first one is it actually increases price responses to those exogenous shocks. So the market will become more volatile. The second is that total number of allowances has actually increased. Um, also, of course, the MSR can only cancel, but if it cancels less than it would have done otherwise, the net effect is an increase. Um, so announcing today that in 10 years time, you're going to shut down a coal-fired power plant increases the number of allowances in the market. Um, and that, of course, is not what uh, is uh, a sensible thing or a sensible response to such a, an overlapping climate policy. And this is kind of conceptually the, the big risk of the mechanism that has been um, set up uh, with the MSR. Um, oh yes, those are exactly the two, the two things I've already pointed out. So just to briefly remind you, um, MSR is fine for past and current events. It's conceptually um, off for um, anticipated events. And there is a solution. Um, and the solution is to use a different measure to um, identify changes in scarcity in the market. And the obvious one is to use prices because allowance prices are exactly what um, uh, transmit and capture changes both in current scarcity and in anticipated scarcity. And by having a quantity adjustment, so a, a cap adjustment that responds not to another quantity, but to the price. It allows um, essentially to give back the control over the um, response of the system to those shocks to the regulator um, by, specifying, by specifying how the quantity responds to um, changes in the market price, you can actually control exactly what's going to happen, not only for current, but also for future shocks. It is better in achieving the three targets I've listed before. So it will actually increase um, price stability. It will reduce supply demand imbalances, no matter where they come from. Um, and yes, it will also um, reduce price volatility and thereby um, make investments um, more attractive. And it makes the effects of this mechanism way more transparent. At the moment, the rules are transparent, but the effects of the MSR or how the MSR affects um, the short and long run supply and hence price and all of that, um, they are very, very complex and often counterintuitive. Um, and that could be avoided with a price-based uh, quantity adjustment. Um, and here is just one example of how something like that, like that could look like. Essentially, you would specify um, in the regulation something like a supply curve for allowances. And here is just one example. And you see the um, this version here um, shares one feature with the current MSR, namely it can only cancel allowances, but not generate them. So the achievement of the um, overall climate target is guaranteed. But if for some reason um, we could get there cheaper, it specifies exactly how much of that is translated into um, price reductions, meaning lower costs for firms and households, and how much of it um, translates into a more ambitious climate target. So that's the, the black arrow, whereas the blue is the cost reduction. And essentially by determining the slope of that line, and here's another example where the slope is different, you can directly affect this key trade-off between cost reductions and emissions reductions. Um, and that's exactly essentially what's behind a lot of the climate policy discussions. And here you can actually pinpoint it um, and set it um, at the European level. Um, and you have no risks whatsoever of what we've seen before, namely um, downward sloping supply curves that have a lot of, kind of unintended and um, 
undesired consequences. So to summarize again, um, a price-based quantity adjustment um, allows you to increase price stability. Um, so you could keep those demand supply imbalances in check, no matter where they come from. Um, you can induce stronger investment signals because you actually reduce uh, price uncertainty. And this also reduces um, firms need for hedging. Um, if they have more confidence in what the price will look like um, in a couple of years, they will have less need to um, bank allowances to hedge against those price risks. You can actually guarantee and control the climate um, benefit of overlapping policies such as coal phase outs, which at the moment you really can't do. Um, and those effects actually are predictable to all market participants and to regulators at other levels, um, federal governments, um, local governments, and so on. So that's it. And um, if you're interested, here's the short link to the full paper. Um, and of course, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Grisha. Um, so the paper we will also put online together with the recording. And so now, Johanna, if there are any clarification questions, uh, why don't you go ahead, please? Yeah, I have uh, three clarification questions for you, Grisha. Uh, first one, is it correct to understand that with a price-based mechanism, you gain control over prices, but lose some control over the cap? Uh, second one, I'll just ask them all, right? That's probably easy. Um, why don't we just uh, adjust the thresholds when cancellations reduce hedging demand? Isn't that another way to deal with the problem? And final uh, clarific clarification question. Um, well, the the first graph you showed on how uh, the MSR has this, these conceptual risks, they are somehow dependent on assumptions about firm behavior. How sensitive are the results about different firm behaviors? Okay, thanks. Um, I, I I try to make it quick, but it's uh, it's tricky. So there always is a trade-off between the price and the quantity or the cap response. The, and, and no matter which instrument you use, you can't get around it. You, can't, you can never fix both at the same time. Um, but what the price-based mechanism allows you is to actually know exactly how you choose that trade-off between a price adjustment and a quantity adjustment. Um, whereas the current MSI, essentially it does it, but very often in a way where you actually get things that you don't, they could kind of get it wrong in both dimensions. Um, you have more price response and the wrong type of quantity response, which is kind of this downward sloping supply curve uh, that that's implicit in in some responses, and that's what you certainly don't want. Um, and you could avoid those and have a an open discussion about how you actually want the system to translate shocks into price and quantity responses. And there's an entire universe out there of how you could deal with that. Um, and just kind of taxes and fixed cap schemes are just extreme points, but you could have anything in between as well. Um, the question of whether reducing the the um, MSR or the TNAC thresholds to respond to lower hedging needs, well, <laughs> a, it does it would not address any of the issues I've raised because they are at a at a way more conceptual level. As soon as you use the TNAC as a measure that drives MSR intake and hence cancellations, you will see those problems um, that I've just outlined. And essentially what I, the point I was trying to make is that having a price-based cap adjustment reduces the hatching demand. So it's not the response to a reduced hatching demand, it's actually the reason or one of the reasons for reduced hatching demand. Whereas um, reducing the the thresholds is, is the opposite, it's a response, but it will not by itself uh, reduce hedging demand. Maybe quite the opposite because it might increase price volatility. So it might increase hedging demand. Oh, well, and the last one, sorry, the behavioral assumptions. Um, so of course, kind of, if, if you look at the quantitative effects, yes, they depend on, on behavioral assumptions, but again, um, qualitatively, um, they do 
exist also for myopic firms, short-sighted firms, and and different types of market behavior. At least as there is some 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 degree of forward-lookingness, so that they are not completely only looking at today's um, market outcomes. Then you will get those effects, and just kind of the the timing um, and the quantitative um, nature that will change. But there are papers out there that that do that or produce the same effects with with myopic firms. Yeah, thanks. Great, thank you, Grisha. Um, so we can discuss these and further points um, after after our last input as well. Um, so now, if you don't mind, if you stop share exactly. So you switch over to Markus Ferdinand, who will now tell us about ETS reform and MSR review and analyst perspective. So let me just introduce Markus briefly. He is the head of EU Power and Carbon Analytics at ICE. Um, he heads the analytics team forecasting developments in European power and carbon markets uh, at ICES. Um, he provides quantitative and qualitative analysis to stakeholders in the energy market area. Uh, Markus has been around for a while. He has followed uh, European global uh, and global energy markets closely uh, for more than 10 years and advises clients in the private sector as well as EU institutions and governments. And previously, Markus worked at uh, ECOFIS and headed the ETS team at Thomson Reuters in Oslo, Norway. Um, so, Markus, um, why don't you go ahead? Take you. Well, thanks a lot uh, for that, Alex. Um, so, in my short intervention, I'll focus on the role of uh, of thresholds and withdrawal rates, um, as we've heard of uh, quite a bit already today. Um, then I'll briefly touch on the aviation sector demand and how the MSR accounts for it. And then I'll spend a bit of time uh, looking into the interplay of the MSR review with the 2030 target debate, uh, which has been mentioned by Verena earlier as well, um, which I think is extremely important because um, obviously we do have quite a bit of um, a different policy um, interaction here. Um, yeah, so as you all know, the MSR review does not happen in isolation. Um, it has to be seen in the context of the wider EVTS reform debate. Um, so we talk about a change to the 2030 target. Um, question is whether this is going to land on 55% net target or 60% gross target. 55% um, net um, includes for things like LUCF, for instance, uh, which is the position of the Commission and the uh, council and 60% gross uh, does not include things, so it's more ambitious um, in that regard and is the current position by the parliament. Um, so, yeah, we have trilogue negotiations ongoing on this at the moment. Um, there are some optimistic uh, voices saying that they might end uh, landing on, uh, on a compromise by 22nd of April. So, let's see whether this is possible. Um, another um, large topic to look at is the burden sharing of ETS versus non-ETS emissions um, by 2030, um, rebasing as a one-off cap decrease, um, and also the basically the timing on when the cap trajectory will change. So I'll first outline a few issues with the current setting um, of the MSR and then highlight the impact the different design options and interplays with the wider ETS reform will have on our price forecast. Um, looking at the threshold, I would say requires a look into the different liquidity needs of different market participants. So um, what you see here is basically our expectation on either hedge requirements or um, short positions evolving. So the utility sector, uh, which is the gray area here, will continue to decarbonize. Uh, we do see around 80 gigawatts less hard coal and lignite until 2030 compared to today. Uh, doubling of the renewable capacities and more than halving the sector's hedge demand from today's perspective. So this is obviously quite significant. On the industry side, I depicted the industry short positions, uh, which is the blue area, which is going to grow over TP4 and the, tra the, the fourth trading period, which is mainly a result of um, lower free allocation and less availability of banked allowances. Um, but it's obviously only a rough estimate, um, as it's quite unclear yet on how hedging behavior will evolve, especially on the industry side, I'd say. Um, not accounted for, I have here is the growing interest of the financial sector to this market um, and the stickiness of that sector uh, in terms of holding positions, which, uh, yeah, I guess is something that uh, everyone looks at at the moment when looking into where the prices uh, have gone um, recently. Um, so trading around 43 euros at the moment. Um, 
one of the main issues, obviously, identifying, uh, or we have identified, and <laughs> I guess we're not the only ones, uh, when looking at the current MSR setup is the principle of the upper threshold um, as a step function. So what you see here is two examples of what could happen um, in case the TNEC uh, on this left-hand side here is slightly above the upper threshold, so at 835 million tons with the upper threshold at 833. In this case, around 200 million tons of allowances would be deducted from, from auction volumes. In the right, in this case, two right hand side, um, if the TNEC at the same kind of more or less same market environment is at eight, 830 million tons, the auction volumes would not be cut at all, right? So this step function um, is obviously um, some, some uh, sort of an issue with the current MSR setting. And it also, I would say, has the potential to create um, volatility and, and potential speculation. Um, another issue in our view is the non accounting of. The aviation demand for EOAs. So um, the TNAC is defined as all supply to stationary installations minus all demand from stationary installations. So basically this column uh, minus this column, simply speaking. And the problem with the current legislation is um, like this is the legally determined market surplus to TNAC, right? What it doesn't account for is the demand and supply for the aviation sector, which is excluded here, um, as the aviation sector has a significant net demand for EOAs, um, even uh, accounting for COVID, uh, this calculation method suggests a, high, a higher surplus than the factor is around in the market, which causes the MSR to withdraw more allowances as the TNEC is the basis for that. And it also changes the meaning of the lower threshold, um, as I'm going to show you on this next slide, because the MSR would only release allowances if the TNEC drops below 400 million allowances, um, as the aviation sector claims a growing number of EUAs for its own compliance, while aviation emissions are not counted for. The delta between the calculated TNEC and the real market surplus grows, right? So it makes it impossible at some point for the calculated TNEC to fall below the lower threshold of 400 million allowances. Um, this is one of the elements which I think needs to be addressed by the review. Um, and I'm going to show you a price scenario in a second. Um, what would happen should that not get addressed? Um, yeah, which brings me to the market impact because, um, yeah, bread and butter of uh, on our end is to basically calculate what this could mean to um, to come prices. And I've laid out now a few settings and issues that need to be discussed in line with the MSR review. Um, so let's have a look what addressing these elements would mean for carbon prices. That said, we've published an extensive report. Um, including a detailed description and analysis of the interplay between the MSR review and the wider EUETS reform uh, that you can download from our ICIS.com uh, pages, or I think it's also going to be shared after, um, after this workshop. Um, yeah, so showing you a few scenarios, what you see here is basically price scenarios, so the EUA price um, over the years. Um, in this case, we just kept the threshold as it is at 833 million tons, the upper threshold, um, and we use three different withdrawal rates, um, so 12, 18, and 24%. Um, and what you see is that these lines differ because during the years when the MSR is triggered, um, obviously the, um, the volume that gets withdrawn from, allowance, uh, from, from auction volumes is different. So all three scenarios show that the market is expected to get tighter until 2023. Um, so there is actually um, kind of an increasing kind of price trajectory here. Um, and with a 24% withdrawal rate, um, approximately 200 million tons more allowances are removed from, from auction volumes compared to the 12% scenario. So this is basically explaining this big increase here in prices versus the dotted red line, which is 12%, continued 12% then. Um, so what you also see is that these trajectories approximate each, each other again towards 2030, uh, which is simply uh, because the MSR would not get triggered during the last five years of phase four. Um, and yeah, it basically shows that uh, withdrawal rate matters during the years when the MSR is triggered, but um, if it's not triggered, it doesn't matter where the withdrawal rate stands, right? So I leave this dotted red line, which is the 833 million tons upper threshold and the 12% withdrawal rate as of 2024 uh, 20, onwards then um, as the base scenario to compare all the other scenarios with it I'm going to show. Here, um, I'm adding three more scenarios, which is basically changing the thresholds in addition um, to changing the withdrawal rates, right? So I basically lower them to um, the upper threshold to 600 million tons, the lower threshold to 200 million tons, 
um, to reflect the reducing hatch demand um, over time. Um, and what you can see is that with this um, change in thresholds, the MSR gets triggered for two to three additional years in comparison to keeping the threshold at 833 uh, in our modeling, right? There might be different assumptions that lead to different results. Um, I should probably say that as well. Um, so the interesting effect, I would say, is for the 24% scenario in this case, which is this upper line here, um, which uh, yeah, basically reaches the upper threshold one year earlier than the other two scenarios uh, with the 600 million tons threshold. Um, so the dark blue line rises the highest to levels around 60 euros per ton in 2024, but then drops quickly to levels even below some of the other scenarios as the upper threshold is reached. And this is like where the step function issue comes in. Um, that I explained a bit earlier. Um, as highlighted earlier, a continued exclusion of the aviation sector from the MSR TNEC calculation leads to growing market scarcity. So the blue line reflects a policy continuation scenario, 833 million tons upper threshold, 12% withdrawal rate, continued exclusion of the aviation sector from the TNEC calculation. And this leads to prices around 60 euros towards the end of phase four, some 10 euros higher compared to an aviation sector inclusion in the calculation, which again is depicted by the red line which causes the MSR being triggered three years less than or fewer than in the other scenario. Just briefly, um, and as said, this is explained uh, in details one of the reports. So I talked about rebasing a bit earlier. Uh, we have modeled four different scenarios in this context, basically no rebasing, which is the LRF change as of 2026, and then to reach the 2030 uh, cap of 830 million tons in line with the 55% target. Uh, which results in an, in an LRF of 5.2% per year, so quite significantly up from uh, the 2.2% that we are at the moment. Uh, but no rebasing, right? High rebasing aims to maintain um, a 2.2% uh, LRF, um, which inc was including the UK um, after Brexit, excluding this installation leads to a slightly lower LRF of 2.0%. Um, but that requires a one-off um, reduction of um, 200 million tons, uh, sorry, of uh, 400 million tons approximately um, in the start in this rebasing year, which is uh, 2026 then. The medium rebasing is basically halving that effect, and then we include one early LRF change, which starts in 2024 compared to 26 in the others, and then an early rebasing, which is basically, um, re yeah, basically mirroring this medium rebasing scenario, but on top of this early, um, early cap change. I know this is quite a quite a bit of info, but I just wanted to show you now the resulting prices. Um, so rebasing provides additional scarcity to the market, as you can imagine, uh, as it reduces the overall available budget of allowances. Um, and you see the four rebasing scenarios um, depicted here, um, all with an 833 million tons upper MSR threshold. Um, so this uh, the medium um, rebase and the early RF provide mild price support, I would say, compared to the baseline scenario. The early rebase scenario, which is this, uh, this grass green line here, provides continued support to the price as it creates a growing scarcity over time. And it ensures the 2030 target is reflected at an early point during phase four already. The high rebase scenario, this, uh, this green and uh, dark green line, suggests that the amount of rebasing is quite important. As a too ambitious setting, I'd say, could also send the market uh, quite high. Which brings me to my conclusions. So, um, yeah, what we have seen is that the market will remain remain uh, tight until 2023, when the MSR would fall back to a less ambitious setting. We assume that in most of our scenarios, uh, the cap change will only happen at the start of the second allocation period of phase four, so in 2026. And therefore, the MSR setting remains particularly important between 2024 when it reverts back to the less ambitious state um, and 2026 when the cap change would take over. When looking at the parameters, the thresholds seem to matter more in our view than the withdrawal rate, as the withdrawal rate can only determine the outtake volume once the thresholds have signaled that the MSR has to get active. With a decarbonizing ETS and lower demand for utility hedging, the thresholds will need to be scrutinized. Um, and overall, the question I think is which role the MSR should play in a strengthening overall market framework. So our modeling shows that an early cap change in combination with a medium one of rebasing would actually put the MSR in the back seat, um, only to be activated in times of system shocks. So I leave it here. I'm looking forward to the, the debate and uh, back to you, Alex. Thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, so Johanna, um, any clarification questions for Marcus? 
Uh, no, I think he made everything very clear, but I've collected uh, some things for the discussion. Perfect, perfect. So, well, this uh, then um, concludes our uh, inputs and uh, we can move on to the panel discussion, which is going to feature Verena, Grisha, Markus, and as a new participant, Adam Berman. Um, so, uh, I will briefly introduce Adam, um, if you don't mind. Um, Adam Berman works at the Euro as the European Policy Director at um, the International Emissions Trading Association. And there he provides analysis and advice on European climate policy with a particular emphasis on the EU ETS and related policies. And prior to AITA, um, Adam worked as an analyst in the energy industry and on international climate policy issues. And so Adam, if you don't mind me asking um, with the question that we would like to lead the discussion off with, um, how, in your view, has the MSR reform debate changed in the context of the COVID pandemic and the 55% goal? Sure. Well, thanks very much for uh, for having me today and, and for the really fantastic insights we've just heard from, from all the speakers. Um, I'll just give a, a little bit um, of, a, of a perspective, hopefully, from, from the business angle, as AITA um, is, is a group that represents um, business from across different sectors covered by the EU ETS, but also probably a little bit more of a, a policy and political lens, as that's certainly my background, less of a, less of a technical background. Um, I'm not going to comment on on the numbers of of you know intake rate activation threshold. We can do that in in Q and A. But I'll just say, in relation to your first the first part of your question about COVID nineteen, I think we can probably all agree that the MSR has exceeded or at least met expectations. I can think back to spring last year when I was fielding calls from lots of different people saying we're really worried about what's going to happen to the market because of the economic downturn, uh, and yet the market has stayed in remarkably good shape over the last year, all things considered. It's working. Could the MSR be working better? Certainly. Um, but I think we need to be a little bit wary of the political context. And so as to the second part of your question to how to align the MSR with the 55% or the proposed 55% target, I just say we have this phrase in English, which is not to let the best be the enemy of the good. The MSR is working pretty well now. And I think I'll just comment on a couple of things that have been raised on this call. There are mechanisms of the MSR that need to be improved, that need to be revised. We need to be really careful about what we do with the activation thresholds. We need to be really careful about you know, what we do with the intake rate going down to, to the 12%, I think would be uh, would be risky, run the risk of, of uh, you know, uh, damaging the market. But I think there are some larger reforms that we've really got to ask ourselves whether it's whether it's worth uh, risking them. And so uh, I would just say to to Keisha's idea, which is really interesting on an intellectual um, sort of basis, I'd say I just wonder whether shifting to a price based quantity adjustment at a time when we're also revisiting every single climate pillar of the European policy is necessarily a, a sensible move. Uh, I would also say in relation to the price floor, which Verena has talked about, um, you know, I think Verena, you mentioned that uh, it would provide stability or sort of clarity for market participants. I don't know, not the market participants I speak to. Um, I think that, that this is an idea that sort of barrels back and forth occasionally. Some member states very keen on it, other states, other member states understandably less so. Um, and I think you know, certainly the business community, which which I represent, is keen for as free a market as possible. The advantages of an ETS is precisely because it's a market, not because it has a price bracket through which we can somehow apply a market mechanism. So I would just say, as we move on to this Q&A here, the learnings for me are to try and focus on the things that are really significant, which are the key mechanisms of the MSR, and to, to try not to let ourselves get distracted by things that, as of yet, are either untried, untested, or perhaps just very large-scale reforms, which we may not want to risk as we're aiming toward net zero in only 30 years' time. Thank you very much, Adam. Um, so, Verena, what are your views on this question? And if you, of course, want to react to anything that Adam has said, 
Please yeah, please do disagree with me. That's absolutely fine. <laughs> we need some uh, conflict in this webinar. So, <laughs> thank you. Well, um, maybe that's also there was a question in the chat to me why um, I advocate rather the current MSR than a price triggered one, and I think that's pretty much along the lines what Adam just said. We thought that political um, like likeliness that this reform will take place is of course a lot higher if we are in the parameters that are already known and established and therefore we focused mainly on those points i do see the the attractivity of a minimum price as long as it doesn't come together with the maximum price because then we would risk of course the main advantage of an emissions trading scheme that is really to uh, conserve the overall cap. I'd love to comment a bit on the aviation part um, that Marcus raised. And um, I do believe that it is fine and should stay as it is that aviation is not taken into account for the TNAC. And why is, is that? Because we do see that um, CO2 emissions in the aviation sector have a larger climate impact than they have in the stationary sector because it's a well there there are a lot of non co2 effects going up uh, on up in the sky that i'm not able to explain and it's not very easy to um quantify it but it's clear that at least double the effect is caused by aviation so if we take the aviation demand that should trigger abatement in the stationary sector if they pay for it um and and take it into account into the MSR, then the MSR will be less effective. And this is even though aviation emissions have a higher impact on the climate. And therefore, I think it should stay as it is in the definition. We've uh, included a part in, of this in the paper, um, but I hadn't touched on it today. And the question on the what is the intake or the thresholds more important? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe they can go hand in hand. And I do believe that even though the cap is adjusted, and for me, the cap is the main uh, part to set ambition. But even though the cap is adjusted, we should have a strong MSR to safeguard for all the unforeseen developments. And it's a, a no-lose option because if it's not needed, it's not triggered, and then it's not harming anybody. All right. Um, well, uh, Grisha, do you want to weigh in? Um, yeah, so let, let me first start kind of with the, with the COVID versus 55% uh, 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 challenges. And the COVID one, I think, is, is um, first kind of in line with my, with, with, with my talk. That's kind of an unexpected immediate effect. MSR is, is, is reasonably able to to cope with that unless of course uh, COVID really reduces the growth expectations over the next 10 15 or even more years and uh, there are papers out there that show that kind of the longer or the more persistent the COVID-19 effect is the less effective the MSR will be um, and of course in terms of identifying the actual contribution of the MSR or its specific design on how the market dealt with the, the, the drop in demand is of course hard to disentangle from the parallel uh, discussion on about the 50-50 target. Because if you at the same time have a discussion about uh, tightening supply, um, that might of course completely kind of yeah uh, overshadow kind of the, the MSR's effect. So it's really hard to, to disentangle um, the two things. Um, but I'm really curious on, on kind of, kind of to see studies and of course uh, kind of market participants um, perceptions on that. Um, with respect to the to the more ambitious climate target and also kind of to the scenarios the the commission put out there in their impact assessment, I think it highlights that um, we will see at least as many overlapping policies, if not more. Um, also, especially especially depending on whether the EWTS will be extended or not in the future than we've seen in the past. So I think making the EWTS, and that means in particular the MSR, able to 
productively interact with overlapping policies is one of the key issues in achieving those more ambitious targets. And, and I think, at least from my perspective, a, a key insight from, from the past research of the last kind of two or three years was that currently the MSR is not in a good shape to do that. It's actually counterproductive in a lot of very relevant cases. And that's not what we want if we want to have a successful, coherent policy framework that actually brings us um, to those minus 55 and then, of course, net zero targets. Um, so we need a powerful instrument and a coherent set of instrument mix. Um, and in my view, the MSR is not giving us that at the moment. Um, it's been fine in kind of reducing some of the historic surplus, um, and it will continue to do so. Um, but in responding to something like a discussion over the 55 target and then kind of cap adjustments, overlapping policies, um, there, there really expectations do matter, anticipation does matter, and that's what the MSR is ill um, designed to, to deal with. Um, so yes, it, it, it's a bit of a kind of a, a more fundamental reform proposal, but it's by no means untested waters because essentially all other cap and trade schemes that do have some flexibility mechanisms do use price adjusted, uh, uh, a price based uh, quantity adjustment. Um, even even the EUTS has a price based thing in there, it's just never been used because it's kind of only an emergency um, aspect. And and as kind of Adam just said, oh, um, because it is a market and hence we shouldn't fix prices. Uh, well, A, I never, I never argued for fixing prices. I argued for adjusting the cap based on prices. And that's exactly what all other markets do. Um, they have a supply curve that uh, responds to prices. If prices increase, firms want to produce more. If they drop, they produce less. Every other market works that way. Um, only the UTS um, with the MSR, at least in some situations, does exactly the opposite. If prices increase, um, they reduce the demand, and if they drop, they increase it. So that's completely against any typical market logic. And all my proposal wants to do is essentially reestablish um, the UTS as a, as a functioning market with all its um, stabilizing elements that typically markets do have. But the MSR, at least in some cases, undermines them. And that's, I think, is a big risk um, also for achieving those targets. Well, thank you for this perspective, Grisha. And um, last but not least, Markus, for the opening round. Yeah, uh, I think we're kind of deviating a bit from the question, uh, which uh, I might take the liberty to do as well. Uh, I mean, for me, actually, I, it, it's a really, it's a fundamental question which role the MSR shall play um, today and also in the future, right? And I mean, today, I would say it is de facto a major price driver. Um, and I think it was not necessarily designed to be one. So it's a question um, whether it should stay within this role or whether it should in a way fall back to what's a backstop mechanism embedded within a very strong 2030 framework. And I think this is something that uh, has been alluded to um, a few times already. So, um, I mean, in a way, it's a question on what we like, what should be put on the MSR in terms of its functioning. And I do think um, overhauling the MSR, especially with a price based trigger, um, is quite a dangerous debate to have, in my view, especially at this point in time, um, where there are so many loose ends which need to be tied together. Um, and I do think um, the major effort at the moment needs to be on, on getting the 2030 framework and potentially post-2030 framework, right? Um, so I would say the MSR is there to maintain the market balance close to a level where scarcity is felt by the market. Um, and to provide an element of flexibility to the supply side, um, which was fixed before the MSR was introduced, right? So this um, has certainly worked. Um, it is not really designed uh, to guarantee a certain price level or to change the cap based on a, on a certain price level. Because, um, yeah, in a way, um, I mean, this, this market, this overall market framework is, is designed to ensure that with um, a a stringent and, and coherent demand supply balance, emissions can be reduced at the lowest cost, right? I mean, this is the function of this market. Um, so 
if a dedicated price-based element is desired um, for various purposes, I would say this needs to be clearly labeled as such and then introduced in form of a different mechanism, like, I don't know, price floor, ceiling, whatsoever. Um, and the MSR, in my view, is more there to prevent the market from supply shocks and not from uh, from price shocks. So, uh, yeah, I would probably leave it here for the opening round. Well, thank you very much, Marcus. And now I suppose um, we need to decide because I think we already have a nice discussion going among the panelists. Uh, so now we need to make a decision whether to continue this discussion or uh, whether uh, Johanna believes there are some burning questions that we should we should interject uh, before you guys uh, go on. Um, yeah, I can tell you that the discussion is very well reflecting what's going on in the chat uh, anyways. So this question about uh, what is most important uh, in overall ETS reform, how important is the re reform of the MSR, what is possible until 2030? Uh, and also, but also these questions, yeah, how important is uh, quantity versus price triggers? Uh, maybe more to uh, Grisha uh, again, like... Um, how would that even look, this uh, transferring the instrument from a quantity-based one to a combined one or to a price one? Yeah, but it's uh, it's a lot about uh, how important is the MSR as, uh, as part of the, all of the different elements in, in the ETS uh, and uh, sort of, yeah, between quantity and, and price triggers. So does... Um, do do you does 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 any of you want to uh, say something more? I, I believe Marcus has has definitely driven the conversation in this direction as well. So, what is the actual role of the MSR? And there seem to be different conceptions of this. No, I mean there seems to be some one view is to say, well, this is a backstop, and they, it should it should ideally never. Um, be activated unless there is an emergency. Others view it as part of the, you know, maybe not on even footing as the as the actual target, the cap, but but as some important uh, auxiliary uh, function. So, um, do you want to uh, do you want to say perhaps something on your views with respect to this balance? Well, maybe it's something in between because we've seen that political timelines take longer than developments uh, in reality have taken uh, place in the last times. And therefore the MSR is taking a lot larger role than originally envisaged. And I think that's fine. I think we do need something that has a faster reaction to speed than the cap setting. And knowing that the MSR is not the fastest of all options, um, definitely the cap setting would be slower and um, too slow, I think, to really trigger now the, the actions we need in order to get on path to the climate targets. Yeah, maybe I can jump on this because I mean, I what I mean, I didn't intend to say that I do think the MSR should never be triggered, right? This is uh, probably a wrong understanding. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I guess the MSR has played a vital role to bring the market back to the level or to kind of its state where it is today. Um, without the MSR, the market would have been um, still quite in a super oversupplied state, right? So, it was extremely important to have the MSR um, kind of. Um, being designed and implemented. Um, I think it's more a question like what role the MSR should play in the future. And this is what I'm more alluded to, right? Because I do think the MSR has done a tremendous job in kind of re-establishing a certain amount of scarcity. It has kind of brought back um, um, the belief that this market is, is, is able to actually steer emission reductions in the future. It also has um, basically um, reinstalled trust within um, compliance and non-compliance players that this market is actually um yeah it is not kind of looking at uh, at the current state of of uh, of oversupply but also um uh, basically um bringing back this intertemporal effect right that like Grisha alluded to i think where um people look further ahead um in order to to make their the decisions again so i think at the moment with this 2030 target debate there is a, a possibility for um reducing the importance of the msr 
to kind of do exactly this reinstalling scarcity and giving a firm view into what Europe wants to do with uh, with a decarbonizing, decarbonizing future. And I think this is the point in time where um, focusing the efforts towards the 2030 debate and installing probably a a more a more stringent cap um, in this regard and installing that early on during phase four would push the MSR back to uh, to kind of its, I would say, original intended uh, state, which is then to act when something goes wrong on that end, but not to kind of drive the market. Perhaps, uh, Alexander, if I can just come in briefly, um, I, I, I'd echo Marcus's comments, I think, and, and say, at least from Maita's perspective, that, that the MSR is there as a tool to deal with supply demand issues, primarily the LRF is there to, to, to drive price signal. Um, I think I would say you know, it has been successful, but as we're thinking about the future and the role that the MSR can play, I think we're already being given a bit of a glimpse into it by the commission. Again, if we if we cast our minds back a year or so ago, um, it looked as if there was going to be an MSR review, which would stand in isolation from review of any other EU ETS mechanisms. And there were lots of us, myself included, who were pushing to try to have a more holistic review, which included all these different mechanisms. Because of the Fit for 55 package, that has now happened. And we're here talking about the MSR, but the M there wasn't a standalone MSR consultation. There was an EU ETS directive consultation. Uh, and I think that gives us a little bit of a glimpse into the way perhaps that the Commission views the MSR now, that it is an incredibly important tool. But I think as, uh, as Marcus just said, um, it, it may well be taking a bit of a back seat in some of these high level discussions, um, it, you know, in, in relation to what the future of the cap is going to be, the future of the LRF, which are, I think, at least from where I sit, the, the primary mechanisms to drive decarbonisation and the MSR has a very important role to play there. But uh, and I'm not sure it's there just for emergencies, it's there for everyday usage. But at the end of the day, the MSR is there to tell us that the market isn't quite working as it should be, um, or that uh, you know something's happening uh, in terms of surplus building up. So I, I would just say, when we're thinking about the future of, of the MSR, it in, a, in a way, it's a little bit tricky to take it in isolation now and say, what what's just going to happen to the MSR? Because we also have to think, how will the Commission and indeed the whole of the EU uh, view the MSR in relation to these other mechanisms, which are probably taking more importance uh, in terms of the, the discussions at the moment? So if I may ask all of you, what do you think are no regret options for MSR reform? So what what, what is something that we can do and um, no regardless? Anyone just please go ahead if, if anyone feels like uh, jumping in. Or perhaps not. Um, Jakob, you had a question um, earlier. Do you want to do you want to uh, have the honor of? Because unfortunately, time is running out very maybe, soon. Do you want to go ahead? Maybe I add one last comment on the role of the MSR and the cap. We mm -hmm. did the sensitivity analysis looking at an ETS reform and uh, with rebasing and lower emissions. And of course, this whole analysis depends strongly on your ex expectations for the emissions development, but if the emissions go down in line with the impact assessment by the Commission, even with rebasing and a high LRF, there will still be a high structural surplus in the market or historic surplus. So the MSR will have an important role to bring down the surplus until 2030, even with a higher cap. I agree that the cap should be the one that's setting the emissions pathway, but we'll need the MSR to tackle the historic surplus, even with very ambitious climate policy. Does anyone like to comment on this point by Jakob? If not, then, um, or if no one else from the chat, Johanna, uh, did, you, did you collect anything else? Uh, well, there's one more question. Um, why don't we just tax CO2 emissions and we could save us all these discussions? Maybe that's a good point to end on. <laughs> <laughs> and work on a new oh. seminar about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, that is that is one perspective as well. So, so the the answer is very simple. It requires anonymity. 
um, at the EU level um, in the in the Council of the European Union. And if if you could solve that problem, <laughs> well, a lot of things would become easier. <laughs> well, I, 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 go ahead, Alex. No, I would. I was just. I, I was just going to to give an obvious reply. Another. Obvious okay, fair reply. enough. Yeah. Well, what about uh, certainty of the, of reaching the target, right? That mm -hmm. we lose uh, we, if if you go for the tax, mm -hmm. which is a little bit of a problem. And uh, you know, if if we're trying to some of commit to Paris and and all these nice things. I definitely think that setting the tax level would be a, a huge challenge, even though there weren't legal ones. Um, and whether that's really a level enough to to reach the targets, as uh, Alex said. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I think this is, I mean, probably drifting in the wrong direction now, but uh, um, I mean, I, I do think, I mean, the tax is there for a reason, right? And the reason is that you want to avoid emissions where where it's the cheapest. You want to kind of uh, take into account um, all different abatement options you have on the table and then make sure that they get realized, triggered by a carbon price. And if emissions go down, the price should go down. If the emissions go up, the price should go up, which is obviously something which is a, a very interesting element now to uh, that we have seen that emissions with COVID are going down and the price is going up. Uh, which is different uh, other reasons which i think are probably a bit uh, beyond uh, today's uh, talk um but i do think i mean in, in the end um, it's it's that simple question right how do you set a cap uh, how how do you set a set a tax level um versus um how to how do you kind of uh, versus kind of ensuring that the 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 market in basically reaches the the emission reduction targets um and i mean all these political considerations apart um this is, uh, I, I think, what uh, I mean. It is one of the very successful policy instruments that we have um, in Europe on on the environment policy front, um, which is backed by, I would say, most of the member states at least. Um, and I think it it would be very difficult to to open that debate now uh, on completely changing this approach. A worthy closing statement, in my view. Um, so, unfortunately, I would love to. I mean. We, it, Things are heating up among us now, but uh, I'm afraid we will need to continue this, uh, these discussions in, in similar forums in the future. And um, so now uh, let me thank all of the presenters, all of the panelists and all of the participants, of course, who came to join us today for, uh, for participating in this uh, webinar on the MSR reform. Uh, another reminder is that uh, we will be uh, sharing the recording and background materials soon, and we will let you know about it. So if you do uh, want that information, please um, contact us. And um, otherwise, I wish you all a wonderful afternoon and, um, and uh, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Shall the team stay?